In the first session, as we have two um, speakers, Professor Sherry Marcos and Professor Dimatio. So I, <coughs> I will uh, request Professor Sherry Marcos to, <coughs> to uh, you know, share, deliver his her talk. Thank you. Do I move it side to side? Is it yeah. only from there? Ah, uh, you can move it here also. It's not, sure if it's, okay. it's not working, is it? Okay, only here. Just down and up. Up and down. So, good morning, everybody. It's it's a particular honor and privilege to be here uh, at the Ramanuja Auditorium. So, let me move you on to the great man himself. As you know, he was a mathematical genius. He, uh, he's on par with Euler and Jacobi, the great U European mathematicians. And he was a number theorist. He had a great flair for numbers. And this is a very well-known story that is said about him. Uh, it is about the Ramanuja Hardy number 1729. So the story goes as follows, and I believe it is true. G.H. Hardy went to see Ramanuja in hospital when he was ailing, uh, not exactly on his deathbed, but um, and, um, Hardy remarked that the taxi that he took had the following number, 1729, and surely this is a dull number, Hardy said. And Ramanuja, though he was poorly, uh, you know, without, you know, within a flash, he said, no, 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 on the contrary, this is a very interesting number. It's the smallest number that can be expressed as a sum of two cubes in two different ways. So 1729 is equal to 1 to the power 3 plus 12 to the power 3. And it also can be expressed as 9 to the power 3 plus 10 to the power 3. We had su such powers within, you know, even though we were ill and uh, in a hospital bed, I mean, I'm sure we could achieve wonders. So on this note, my talk is actually about complexity, uh, but from a number theoretic perspective. And, my, and the, um, the roadmap of my talk, I'm interested in understanding how digital agents uh, who operate on encoded information, which can be ground down to numbers and integers, as you know, what has it got to do with complex adaptive systems? And in particular, the question I'm interested in knowing is, how do digital agents, how, did they, how, how can they become smart? Uh, and, in t and I will argue that this is the basis of all intelligence. And in actual fact, uh, the very high tide of complex adaptive systems, the theory at one level, says a system cannot be complex and adaptive until and unless there are such digital agents, these capabilities, uh, of digital agents that can become smart. So it is actually a, a very fun, foundational and fundamental question that I hope to answer this morning. So I would give you evidence of exactly such conditions that lead to complex adaptive systems. And of course, being at the Mathematical Institute, I have to give you some math proofs, and I hope I will get to that uh, and in some detail. So of course, from Moving from one number theorist to the others who have shaped our knowledge of digital agents and of complex adaptive systems, I'm going to, of course, to the great names of Kurt Gödel, Alan Turing, and Emil Post. So who are these people? As we know, digital agents operate on encoded information. Think the genome, right? It is a quintessential digital agent. It is operating on encoded information, which is digitized. With the Second Machine Age, there's a famous book by McAfee and Brill Johnson. It's called The Second Machine Age. And the fundamental nature of the Second Machine Age is that all information is digitized. So, uh, and, and production technologies, as you know, with 3D printing and so on, it's in a digitized form. 
So the reason why we need to understand, so there's a renewed interest in understanding how such digital agents could innovate. The story is that they're operating on digitized information and you know the wonders of digitized information is that at very little marginal cost, I'm talking as an economist because that's who I am, um, with almost zero marginal cost you can, ha you can create um, almost um, error-free copies that is, you know, that you may have heard of digitized music and so you have to give it away because it doesn't cost to produce an addi additional copy and the wonders of digital copying is that it's almost error free. So uh, the, this, this is one of the reasons, now we wouldn't know why in evolution information became digitized. I won't pretend that I know exactly how that happened. But we know the mathematics behind how digital agents would operate uh, based on such codes. And at the, turn of, at the turn of the century, Kurt Gödel, at the age of 23, defined the conditions of, he defined Gödel numbers, which are integers that represented encoded information fine, from a finite alphabet. And I would think that the Gödel incompleteness result is one of the most fundamental results in, in the foundations of mathematics. And I think it is also about the, all of the foundations of science itself. I'm of, of that view now. So what he, the enterprise that he started was of course brought to a completion by Alan Turing and Emil Post because Gödel's work itself predated the notion of an algorithm and of about the Turing machine itself. So though he was working with what are now called recursive functions, in other words the operations that a digital agent would conduct uh, is now of course equivalently called recursive function theory or computation theory. So the interesting thing is that all operations done by digital agents are number theoretic. So the, let me just jump straight into the maths since I'm in the maths department uh, in the maths institute. All digital operations of recursive functions are number theoretic functions with map from n to n. And why is that so? Because it is moving from n an integer which codes, uh, which is, uh, it, which represents a code. So remember by Gödel numbering, which is the pioneering methodology that was introduced, he used prime factorization. Any information from finite alphabet can be condensed into a number. So an operation, a recursive function operation would be number theoretic where you start from a number which is representing information and then you end, you map into another number. But furthermore, the notation there, this is standard notation from let's say Nigel Cutland's book called Computation Theory is this function phi uh, has a, a subscript A, so it is using some algorithm or program, which is again got a girdle number A, on some input X, which is also an integer uh, with a girdle number X. If it halts, so the symbol is that you have the arrow point down, such th this machine or this algorithm uh, with the program A with an input X, will halt and produce an output Q, which is again a number. When you decode it, you'll know exactly what it, what it stands, on, stands for. But the interesting thing is the digital agent itself doesn't know the meaning of anything. It is operating on a syntax syntactical basis. These are just operations on numbers. These are not, so it isn't as if, as, uh, as if that the digital agent would know what any of this means. So these operations would be arithmetic, all operations of arithmetic and all logical symbols and one that I'd be particularly interested in is the symbol of negation. So the domain of these functions uh, is, is a set, let's say WA, so what that is is the domain of this function that is operating with this program A uh, and the notation says as follows, all uh, domain of the function would be all the inputs from which this function operates such that the, uh, the, the program itself halts. Of course now these, these, these entities here can be also, they're entirely comparable to Turing machines. So when the machine halts with this program A with input X, this is the domain and there's also the range. Now there are two types of such functions. There are total computable functions which would operate on the full set of all integers. It will always halt. And I would say all of the, uh, the, the uh, technologies and phenotypes that would, we would consider would be the set of total 
recursive functions because they are encompassing some algorithm or a program which if you feed it to a machine, the machine executes those things and in the humans or in, in life itself, they're 3D printed. So if you want an organ like the heart, uh, it follows the code and the output is 3D printed in some organic materials. This is how wonderful this whole methodology is and I'm bringing to life because a lot of, the, all, lot of this mathematics, people know it in a formal sense, but to this day nobody's related to these foundational issues I'm going to raise today. Okay, so I'm, I'm uh, as I said, interested in, in, in um, establishing what is called um, novelty and surprises. There is a school of thought, in particular that of Stephen Wolfram and Noam Chomsky, who claim that unless we talk about, you know, he, they talk about this equivalence between uh, automata or digital agents and their dy the dynamics they produce and types of dynamics. So they have four types of dynamics, type one, type two, type three, and type four. And it's exclusively the type four dynamics that they call complex. So unless a system of digital agents can produce novelty, new objects or new encoded information that was not previously there, they do not claim that the dynamics is complex. Now this is a very tall order because most complexity theories that I mean never mention type 4 dynamics. They stop short, they think dynamics finishes with chaos, chaotic dynamics. Not so. The most important dynamics in my opinion is type 4 and this has to be brought front and center, otherwise we'd be wasting an opportunity in talking about complexity sciences. So this is, the, this is what they call is the sine qua non uh, of complex adaptive systems. So, but we, have, we are confronted, given that I'm an economist, I'm con we are confronted by many problems. In terms of game theory and the mathematical framework, they actually do not concede that there is even a Nash equilibrium in which you would produce novelty and surprises. Yet, the two big systems in which you find novelty and surprises, of course, is evolution and you know, socioeconomic systems, the, the immune system. These are highly uh, hyper-intelligent and evolving a, a systems in which new objects are produced or new encoded information and new phenotypes and new technologies are produced. So, the neo-Darwinian tradition, as you know, postulates that all innovation is random. It comes from random mutation. This is currently being challenged and the first, about, the first uh, mo uh, molecular biologist to challenge this is Barbara McClintoff, a woman who was awarded a Nobel Prize in her own right. In 1984, she said she discovered things that are called transposons and he, she found that the genome actually edits and changes and adapts to stresses. And she calls this the dynamic genome. Since then I've met a very famous Israeli mathematician, Eshel Ben Jacob, and he calls these properties of the genome the, the creative genome. And he links it straight so front and center with Gödel himself. So let me give you a picture up, up front about how would this map into sets and dynamics. So, Type 1 and type 2 dynamics are, are created by uh, agents who are finite automata and they produce limit points and limit cycles. And everybody's, I don't have to tell anybody sitting in this room what limit points and limit cycles are. These converge to homogeneous systems in, in, in uh, limit points uh, and then in limit cycles you circle around but a, a single attractor. So where do you get type 3 dynamics? You get chaotic dynamics, that's type 3. And then it is only type 4, you know, you may have heard of phrases like, you know, life at the edge of chaos. Uh, the interesting thing is, you, you can map this into machines that halt or not. So this one, the, 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 the machine that we're concerned with, that defines these sets, is a machine uh, where you say, uh, it's a machine that runs on its own code. It's a self-referential machine. The concept that, uh, you know, in terms of the domain of that set, you, you ask the question that does the set contain its own code? In other words, in that domain W subscript A, 
These, this is the domain of all machines that will halt on their own code. So this is the set, the set here is the set on which machines will halt on their own code. They're self-referential machines that will halt on their own code. And now what is very interesting, so this set in the mathematics of ML Post, uh, they're called creative sets. And it's not without reason he's called them creative and productive sets. So if you know machines will halt on their own code, in terms of proof theory, Gödel, within the Gödel framework in for theory of formal systems, these are all the theorems that you can prove. And a theorem, as you know, proof is an algorithm. So starting from some initial conditions, the algorithm will, you know, a proof algorithm will just sort of grind its way forward and end starting from some input x, it'll uh, arrive at q, and at every step, we will not be in any doubt, it's fully deterministic, you will get an output. So there, so here say, in mathematics, if the system was complete, what you would have is everything that is provable, and the negation of everything that is provable will belong to that set. Because interestingly, everything that is provable and the machine that halts, uh, you can list all the contents of that set. So the concept of a rec recursively enumerable set is there, a listable set. Because in the end, what I'm going to say is the answer to the question about is something an innovation is amazingly asking the question, can you get outside of a listable or a machine listable set? How can a digital agent produce a encoded a uh, piece of information that was not part and parcel of any machine listable set. Only that and that alone will succeed in being an innovation or a novelty or a surprise or, in, or the girdle incompleteness or the girdle undecidable proposition. So he rigorous, rigorously proved what is undecidable in the system by a machine. It has to lie outside any set that can be listable. So an innovation, so a lot of people do not think of it that way. So you have a set, let's say a set of phenotypes or actions, if you're a game theorist. Uh, the question that we're asking about innovation is, can an object be produced outside a given set, a listable set, and not only that, are of outside, or outside of all such listable sets? So that's exactly what happens. So here is a set on which all true propositions are theorems, so you can enumerate them one by one. Now the negations of provable theorems, you, can, you know for free that they cannot be proven. Therefore, their negations, you belong to that set, the type 3 chaotic dynamics. So these are negations of these things. So you stick a negation symbol, which I'll show you in a minute. And then you know that set is also listable. But then you are able to prove if the world was complete, then everything that is provable and the negations are refutable that would exhaust all list of propositions, but Gödel discovered that that was not so, that there was an uncountable infinity of objects outside of both of these sets, uh, which makes the world incomplete. So what is amazing is, if the world were complete, we can all go home, because everything could be created by machines. There are objects that lie outside it, but what is interesting is that the object that is also, that lies outside it, which is the type for innovation, is also mechanized, the exit route from any of these sets, the recursive sets are actually, you can produce it by a formal construction. It is a constructive proof and you can create a witness, uh, the undecidable proposition or the innovation in the system that is outside of these. So how, what is this, how does this relate to either game theory of creating novelty in terms of digital agents and, in, and uh, uh, and in terms of uh, uh, what we see is type 4 dynamics. Type 4 dynamics has an arms race structure. And this is how the, produ the, product, uh, the, the productive set uh, uh, looks like. What that means is every innovation will be listed. So uh, after the event, you can incorporate it. So the productive set keeps growing, growing with each innovation. And I'm going to argue things like junk DNA. The symbol for negation is just that, uh, you know, the, sup the superscript on, let's say, BN uh, uh, inverse. So you can actually enumerate everything, all the innovations, one after the other, after the event, not before it. So it is not anticipating, it is non-anticipating. So the object, uh, so these recursive 
in the listable sets will contain all the past innovations and the past innovations all are always constructed in one and the same way it comes from a negation so there are three elements to uh, the the uh, construction of of innovations in these systems first of it, first of it is the necessary conditions is that we've already exhausted the idea of uh, being a digital agent and these operations of digital agents. And this is a very taller, a tall order. In other words, to have all the powers of recursive functions, on one hand you'll say it's all just the operations of arithmetic and all of logical operations, but there's a very interesting thing. The self-reference self and second recursion theorem is very important. And anything that is digitized, as you, as you know, copy-paste uh, uh, comes for free. Um, so those powers in the number one category of what you need uh, are, are already, in my opinion, in, immense powers. The second thing, this is again something that is very important. Uh, in the opening paragraph of Gödel's paper in 1934, uh, he said, he, he brought in the candidate, the character that will create these uh, points of innovation and it's called the liar. The liar, as you know, is a very famous character in the foundations of logic. It's a Cretan liar. So if I say this is false in those days, uh, as you know, that doesn't have a truth predicate. It's undecidable in the sense that if I say this is false, you cannot make out whether it's true or false. But Gödel took the liar. The liar's business in life is to be contrarian or to negate or to falsify. But you, you, it, you can never put a negation side except on something that can be predicted. So in other words, something that has, can, can, can be predicted or computed. Uh, so if A can be predicted, then, then the liar will put a minus onto it. He will negate it. That's his business in life. He will falsify anything he can predict. Now this character is the most important piece. I used to obsess about it a lot, but there is one more element to it uh, that is just as important. Now, uh, people who know, uh, you know, Brian Arthur's intuition about the minority game, uh, you win when you're in a contrarian, and there is no way in which there's no algorithm that will enable you to win as a contrarian. It has to be self-organized, so you cannot, you have to use trial and error. There is no algorithm that will tell you how to win that game. But the role of the contrarian is absolutely vital, and again, if the people talk about complex systems and they do not talk about the liar, then you know they're missing something. The third important, critically important thing about the Gödel mathematics, and which is now going to be relating to things that I'm going to tell you about brain, the brain, how the brain operates, because unless you have these elements to a system, a system will not be able to produce novelty and surprises. You cannot think outside the box. And the third thing is, Gödel mathematics is not about machine execution. It's not about taking a code and running it online in real time. It is actually making a recording of the machine executing offline. It is actually offline simulation. This is so important to understand, and I'll show you what that means. So these are the three ingredients to produce novelty and surprises. And unless and until an intelligent system can incorporate these three things, it cannot, it cannot move outside of a listable set. So unless you can move outside a listable set, your behavior is entrained by what is already there. You cannot do anything new. So uh, let me show you uh, the, the, so fun uh, fundamentally, at the end of the day, what enables you, um, enables you to leave uh, a listable set is that this intelligent digital entity has to encode a Gödel sentence. Now, a lot, of, uh, a lot has been written about the Gödel sentence. At the end of the day, it is simply a self-referential statement by a code saying it is under attack. It is being negated. It's self-referentially saying I am being uh, negated or being attacked. So the highest form of computational intelligence, in my opinion, for a, from the perspective of a digital agent, which is operating on encoded information, is for the code itself to, rea uh, to be, uh, to formally, this is the important thing, it doesn't know it's under, under, under attack. All it knows is as a syntactic phenomena that it is being negated, right? So the Gödel sentence uh, is, 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 the, is the vehicle that does it. Uh, and therefore, unless you can encode it, 
uh, the system cannot become, uh, cannot produce novelty or become smart in that sense. It encodes a formal and incon logical inconsistency which forces any computable function called the productive function to, list, to exit from a listable set. Because if it remains in the listable set, we can prove that the formal system that it is enumerating would be uh, inconsistent. So this is at the nub of uh, what I'm going to say. So from the word get go, unless uh, given that life is formed in a gene in, in, in digitized form and we are uh, we have uh, codes that are representing some some algorithm some an algorithm that is, that if it were run will produce some phenotypes in that organism and so on uh, that code itself should have the wherewithal to recognize hostile agency the liar because the liar can negate the code if the liar can predict the code if the liar has access to the code, in other words, the liar itself is a Turing machine that would take the code, run it, get the output Q, and then negate it, uh, you have to change your code, or you have, to, you have to bring in indeterminism in a fundamental way. So, Ben Jacob uh, you know, has said things like this, Eshel Ben Jacob, this is, he says, this is not, he says, emergence of new forms or entities not previously there. He says, this is not the result of successful accumulation of mistakes or of random mutations. The genome, even in the most early life form, example, the bacteria has endogenous creative capabilities. So he lists a number of uh, elements which are, which are similar to the Gödel logic that I just went through, so I won't uh, do that again. Um, so Noam Chomsky in his old age, as you know, is feuding with all the AI folk who focus on machine learning and of course complexity scientists who don't talk about the type 4 dynamics. Fortunately for my, you know, drawing a parallel with Ramanuja, uh, you know, when he, he kept thinking he, you know, he, 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 because he suffered from bad health, he was worried that his notebooks would not reach a safe pair of hands, who would then, you know, spread the word. Uh, till, till very recently the main proofs I had trouble, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, publishing it. Luckily for me, uh, uh, um, uh, an editor of the Journal of Mathematical Science, you know, for the Institute of Mathematic American Institute of Mathematical Sciences, in the G Journal of Dynamics, and gave they gave this, gave me the space to to put all the details into it. Noam Chomsky actually said the results are quite it, because he's fighting this. A particular debate and at one time I think yesterday we were saying it would appear that he's on the losing side but no there is uh, the, there are forces coming to his help uh, I was just speaking to Mikhail Prop 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 Propenko and uh, so on he's at the University, Sydney University Center for Complexity Sciences and they've just brought out a paper exactly about this idea of why is it that the liar and self-reference is important as a basis of type 4 dynamics. So help is at hand, so you know, the feeling that I may be on the losing end of a debate because now we are in soundbite mathematics and science sometimes, uh, you know, people might just go with the flow for a long time, but there is a group of people who strongly believe that this is what complexity sciences are about. So I will just give you a flavor of uh, you know, where else we have confronted these ideas uh, about the contrarian and the liar, you know, Brian Arthur's uh, genius-like intuition that you need to have a minority game to generate uh, a heterogeneous uh, a agency and also uh, in our, we have a very simple agent-based model where we stripped away a stock market model where we stripped away and we are able to show that unless the payoff function uh, satisfies a minority game. In other words, uh, you win only if you're in a minority and then we compare it with a majority game where you win when you're in a majority. The dynamics that you produce is very different. So let me just cut to that, uh, the, the uh, picture itself. So in a stripped down agent based model where agents can buy and sell one unit of a stock, uh, what is interesting is that agents themselves do not know um, uh, they themselves do not know what payoff structure, when will they win, whether it's a majority or a minority. So this is our economic complexity economics 101 in the University of Essex, which I teach. 
Uh, it, uh, I have to say this myself, I think this is a little gem, this agent-based model, because it drives home the most important thing that you need to know about financial markets, that you are playing a minority game of some sort. You win when you're in a minority. You sell when everybody else is buying, so at the top, at the peak of a cycle here. And if you can sell when everybody is, uh, uh, is when, if you buy when everybody is uh, selling, in other words, you are, and if you are in a minority, you won, uh, you will have succeeded uh, tremendously. So what you have here is that if in the agent-based model the payoff function is a majority, way, a majority game, the price dynamics is a one-way market. There is no endogenous boom and bust. Whereas only when you're playing a minority game and the payoff function, you're rewarded when you're in a minority, do you have endogenous boom and bust. So we stripped away everything and we are able to establish that what drives boom and bust and heterogeneity is actually the fact that the payoff function is contrarian. So the liar is integral. Now, Doyon Farmer and so on, they say, no, what causes boom and bust is, is leverage. Hello, that's not the reason. The fundamental reason is because there is, in fact, in the payoff structure, a contrarian structure, and that is what causes an endogenous boom and bust. So the second thing that I want to establish is, um, you know, in the girdle logic, as we know, there are, four, there are three bits. You have the contrarian and the liar who will negate everything that is predicted. Now, to an economist, actually, this is well understood. The Bob Lucas in 1972 and 1976 talked about uh, anything that can be predicted, uh, policy, if it is predictable, can be rendered ineffective. But that is because there is a liar in, in the game. So the liar will, uh, you know, render a sender or whatever, it will destroy, it can destroy a system. No codes, you know, you have to have in determinism in a fundamental way to keep a complex system um, um, you know, um, uh, sustainable. Predictability is not a good thing. Predictability and all of formalism actually is very weak. Any code can be hacked. So this reason why you have to keep bringing in indeterminism in a fundamental way, and remember a girdle incomplete, uh, the undecidable proposition cannot be computed by any machine whatsoever. It is that degree of uh, non-computability that you would bring in. Uh, and so Lucas had already said that uh, you would need to bring about a surprise if you need to keep the system going. However, the macroeconomists misunderstood what a surprise is. Uh, they thought, of course, it sounds quite crazy and mad to say, oh, you bring in surprise inflation. But what they forget is that um, uh, who do you need to surprise? The only agent you need to surprise is the liar. The liar who would negate everything that uh, he can predict. So this was known to me because Ken Binmore taught me game theory and he had a very classic paper called Modeling Rational Players and he brought in the girdle logic, the specter of girdle. And he says how can, how can game theorists firstly constrain themselves to a fixed action set till the cows come home. There's no innovation in game theory. It is closed and complete and actually it is also inconsistent. And he said uh, the idea that rationality is one where you subscribe to calculable and determinist, determinate outcomes. He said what about the liar? This fell on deaf ears. Nobody, none of my, my game theorist friends who pride themselves of being great mathematicians simply cannot get this. So furthermore, we have this big dogma in game theory. They say Nash equilibrium, nobody's surprised about what others actually do, etc. They deny there is a Nash equilibrium in which you need to surprise or surprise. They have denied that strategic innovation exists. Uh, so we have serious problems in the foundations of game theory and economics itself. So I actually got a personal chair at Essex to show how Essex is so liberal, where I proved a Nash equilibrium exactly in these ways of how you, you would produce a surprise. And the reason for this is because uh, I, was I was inspired uh, to, to go in this direction by F.A. Hayek, who as you know is an Austrian, and he, had a, he, he was very impressed by the Gödel result, and he has a book called The Sensory Order where he claims that the brain is incomplete. So just to sort of move on uh, to this last 
uh, idea that this is not completely out of this uh, realm of what is really happening. So I told you there is a third ingredient that Gödel is about offline simulation. Now, one of the greatest discoveries of uh, the late last century is the discovery of the mirror neuron system. It was the cognitive scientists from Parma University, Vittorio Galesi and so on, who discovered that the brain is, has a complete parallel recording system. So this is exactly on the right hand side here, what you have is, you have the representation of what Gödel uh, better mathematics is. So here you have the machine halting, and on the, right, on the left hand side here, you have the recording of a machine halting. So this is a well-known construction in the Gödel uh, mathematics. Now this is exactly what the brain is doing. On the right hand side you have the canonical neurons that fire. So when I lift my hand, there is a machine execution of my hand being lifted. But then I have a parallel system. The mirror neurons would record exactly a one-to-one -one mapping of that. Now this is very essential because unless this occurs, and of course, this is an embodied offline simulation, so that I can predict you, I can predict you only because I'm running the same code. I'm, I'm running the same code, uh, so if you raise your hand, I can make out what you're doing. If you take a cup and put it to your mouth, I can predict that because that would be the exact firing, neural, neuronal firing that would occur if I had to do the same thing. So this mapping exists, and this mapping exists uh, exactly in the way in which um, the, um, so let me just move on to this great uh, uh, business. Remember I told you there was a set on which there'll be self-referential, uh, all the codes have to be represented. The genomes representation of all codes are represented exactly in that set theoretic structure that I showed you. And then what does the body do? The body instructs uh, uh, to produce the self antigens. So to every code A, it produces an A minus in the, in the uh, medulla thymus. This is again established. And John Matic, the director of the Garvin Institute, so there is a huge microbiome, uh, molecular biology after Barbara McClintoff. These are all acolytes of Barbara McClintoff. They have discovered that uh, there, the body then creates these self antigens, these negations, which is in that set, uh, you know, the, no, the, the refutable theorems, exactly in the same formal system. And what is interesting is that the T cells are trained, the T cells, so that the T cells in our body don't attack our own codes. Uh, they, will self, they will negate, ne negatively select, uh, select out all the T cells that, it, that might attack our own codes, and, and therefore, what I'm trying to say is that all, in all and every area of, uh, of life or wherever there is intelligence of this sort that could make us uh, hyper intelligent and capable of innovation, there's growing evidence that this is the basis, that the basis of intelligence is exactly as in the Gödel mathematics. And encoding the Gödel sentence is actually going to be the major step because even the mirror neuron system uh, there, are, there are experiments that show that not only does it copy, it also can, uh, can encode negation. Uh, this was discovered by Scott Kelso. So I hope I've given you enough food for thought to understand that it is not what you think. Complexity is, you know, obviously complexity for what it's worth, has very deep mathematical foundations. That's the important thing. It is number theory that is at the foundations of all of these. And in the 21st century, I do not have to emphasize how important it is. So the next time you meet an AI man and he says it's all about machine learning, tell him, no, Dom Chomsky was right. The man is about, you know, he's, he's actually, you know, if, if there was a 90, 150th anniversary of the MID, uh, brains, um, uh, brains, maths, and intelligence conference, and he was virtually on a minority of one. But I think there are now a group of us who have understood that what he said was, is correct. And uh, to those of you who are doing complexity sciences, uh, take time out and understand this. And of course, being here in the land of number theory, I hope I've inspired you to look further into this. Thank you. <laughs>